From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now, at the NYSE and at ISIS exchanges and clearinghouses around the world. And now, welcome, Inside the Ice House. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. Here's a backyard science project for parents trying to keep their kids' eyes on something other than an iPad screen during a pandemic. You know that massive telescope on a tripod that someone gave you as a housewarming gift so long ago that's been gathering dust in the basement? Why not take it out for a spin? See what you can see. That's what we did last week in search of Comet Neowise, discovered by and named for NASA's Near Earth Object Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer mission. It was literally a once every 6,800 year experience. Suddenly a cohort of teens found themselves transformed from TikTok mavens to Galileo wannabes. And all it needed was a spray of Windex and a wipe from a paper towel to bring space into crisp focus. The view was okay, but probably not as good as what Chris Cassidy and Robert Benkin could see on July 21st, when they stepped outside to install the most expensive shed in the history of mankind. The two United States astronauts were adding an external storage compartment for the International Space Station, completing, by my count, the 300th spacewalk by U.S. astronauts since Ed White first left his Gemini spacecraft back in 1965. This year was figuring to be as important for humanity's goal to go interplanetary as those Gemini program years in the 1960s. Unfortunately, so far, 2020 has fallen a bit short of expectations with delays in several ambitious projects from companies like Virgin Galactic, that's NYSE ticker symbol SPCE, and Boeing, ticker symbol BA, the result of COVID-19's impact on the global economy. On the investment side, a recent study found that venture capital inflows into space-focused startups were down 83% in the second quarter of 2020, cutting off a good chunk of the cash lifeblood needed for the capital-intensive research demanded by new ideas to take flight. So despite these headwinds, we've seen the first manned rocket to launch from the United States in over a decade. The United Arab Emirates launched its Mars mission and the launch of Lockheed Martin's GPS-3 satellites into orbits. And these are not the kind of GPS satellites that let you simply find your way to the nearest post office. The GPS-3 SV-03 will help provide positioning, navigation, and timing signals for more than 4 billion military, civil, and commercial users, with three times better accuracy and up to eight times improved anti-jamming capabilities over any previous GPS satellite. And yeah, they'll probably also let me find my way to the nearest post office. But joining us today in the Ice House is Rick Ambrose, who leads Lockheed Martin Space. He's going to help us navigate through the complex government and private partnerships that are driving innovation, explain why humanity needs to look to the stars and share how the space economy is going to drive growth right here on Earth. Our conversation with Rick Ambrose is right after this. In our time of greatest need, we want to thank the true heroes around the world for stepping up, for taking care of us and keeping us safe. With your expertise, your commitment, your sacrifice, and your selflessness, we'll work together to create a brighter future. And we thank you for reminding us what really matters. From all of us, thank you. Our guest today, Rick Ambrose, is Executive Vice President of Lockheed Martin Space, NYSC ticker symbol LMT. In his two decades with the company, he's held a number of leadership positions across Lockheed's businesses, including space information systems and global solutions national business and management and data systems. Rick joined the company from Raytheon's command, control, and communications business segment 
and has over four decades of experience in defense and aerospace. Welcome, Rick Ambrose, Inside the Ice House. Josh, thanks. Uh, glad to be here, and thanks for having me. I'm looking for more things to do with the kids with that backyard telescope. Last year, NASA committed to returning a person to the moon by 2024, and what will have been, I think, 52 years and more than four lifetimes for my daughter since Gene Cernan, Harrison Schmidt, and Ronald Evans made the voyage aboard Apollo 17, along with five mice as traveling companions. Why has it taken so long to send a person back to the lunar surface? I think uh, if you look at uh, the history here, as we, uh, you know, built out the space shuttle and uh, spent a lot of time uh, going back and forth to the International Space Station to build uh, multinational uh, partnerships, that kind of kept us in low Earth orbit. But I think the new vision established by the administration and by uh, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine to do this very quickly is very exciting. For those who don't remember Rick, Jay Barbary reporting live from the Kennedy Space Center and instead think of Tom Hanks, Kevin Bacon, and Bill Paxson as astronauts Lovell, Swigert, and Hayes. Do you have your own memories of those Apollo missions and how the world reacted to putting a man on the moon? Absolutely. Uh, I'm in the job I'm in today because I was a 10-year-old kid watching the first uh, man step on the moon which excited me about the moon. And you look up uh, how many times as a kid did you lay out in your roof or uh, in a sleeping bag uh, out camping and look at the stars and, uh, and, and wonder with amazement how they form, you know, how, how they evolve, where we come from and all that. That would, that would mo motivate anybody. But, uh, you know, I think it's exciting. Uh, we're motivated to get back to the moon. It's a, it's a challenging schedule, but we're all in. Uh, with Orion, as you all know, uh, we built, uh, which will go back and forth to the moon, probably the only capsule designed for deep space exploration and been years development. Matter of fact, as we speak, the Orion capsule and the service module are stacked up down at the Cape, ready to launch. And as soon as the uh, space launch system's ready to go, we're going uh, next test launch up and we're going to go past the moon around and back. We're going to get into Orion in, in depth in the second part of the show, but let's go back well before Apollo. Alan Lockheed installed a two-cylinder, 12-horsepower motor on a glider in 1910 when he climbed aboard that homemade aircraft in Chicago and operated its ailerons while its builder, George Gates, operated the rudder and elevators. That was seven years after Wilbur and Orville Wright got the Wright Flyer airborne four miles south of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, back in 1903. Curious, from that 10-year-old boy looking up at the Apollo missions, how did you get your start in the business and then move through it to where you are now? Well, it's interesting to go back there. He's Lockheed Martin's powerful as a hundred and some year old company, as you mentioned, doing innovation um, along the way and navigating all these technology cycles. But for me, again, seeing that, you know, you come out of school, you go to college um, and come out. And I started uh, at that time with Hughes and doing communications. Uh, satellites were booming as uh, the communications emerged, you know, which is what drove this industry, at least on the satellite side of the industry, for a long time. And then just having challenge after challenge. And, uh, you know, again, as Lockheed Martin, whether it's uh, back in, in the time frame of developing aircraft or satellites, we take on the hard roles. If something's hard and difficult, that's what you lean into. And if you want to come into aerospace and defense, uh, that's why you do it, is take on those hard challenges that not only help uh, uh, defend the nation, but also propel all of humanity. And most of our employees walk in every day because they know they're saving lives. We're monitoring now a sensor we built for National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration called the Global Lightning Mapper. Over 1.3 billion images a day are being taken in lightning. And what does that mean? Why well, just take pictures? Uh, well, the science says uh, we might be able to get a 12 to 20 minute advance warning of a tornado if we can perfect this. And that's probably hundreds of lives saved every year. And that list just goes on and on when you deal with space because space is global by its nature. It, it, it has to be global because you're out there monitoring this earth and you realize how precious this earth is and planet which is also why we want to go explore to understand more how Earth works and how do we protect it in the future. The space race of the 60s was this competitive sprint, Rick, between the U.S. and the USSR to the moon that 
directly evolved from the Cold War and a nuclear arms race, but the human urge to explore goes back centuries. Is the drive to explore beyond the moon, as you say now with Orion's plan, simply to borrow from George Mallory's answer to on why he would attempt and ultimately fail to climb Mount Everest because it's there? Well, I think uh, the human condition, uh, naturally, we're explorers. We go back from the beginning of time. We always wondered, what was that unknown? Let's go explore it, whether it was just coming out west, um, you know, Lewis and Clark, or, you know, going to the top of the mountain or what's out there. Now, it's not only that it's there, it's also we realize how finite our resources here on Earth. So can we go out and find rare materials on the moon or in an asteroid? Yeah, you know, there's also that quest of how the universe was uh, formed, and a lot of quests, will we find some some life out there in the universe somewhere? If you think back, uh, at least when I was in grade school, since you shared I've been uh, in the business for four decades, I'm probably a little older than you, uh, we were taught that the reason the Earth was so precious was it's the only place in the, in the solar system with water. But now we're finding water everywhere. I mean, I cannot keep up with NASA publications and the scientists and how they're finding it. it's in different forms, but we learned how to look. And it's that inquisitiveness that drives us, I think, as humanity, whether you're looking at the stars or down to the lowest molecular level in biology and how things work. That's what we're about is learning and discovering. So much focus, as you talked about, going back to the Nixon years on the development of that orbital truck, as beautiful as Columbia was getting jacked up by its solid rocket boosters. In the hindsight of the last 50 years, did the need to put a man on the moon and our subsequent retreat back to low Earth orbit spark or hinder the infrastructure needed to support regularly putting humans into space and eventually colonizing beyond the Earth? Well, it, um, you know, it, it comes down to what your focus is. I think at the time, um, you know, I was pretty early in career uh, with going back to the station and the shuttle and the truck. The theory was that we can get a very fast launch rate uh, up, up, up there going back and forth, we, we would propel technology. And then a lot of experimentation was going on on the International Space Station in, in a microgravity environment from growing food, you know, for it, even for deep space exploration to uh, medical uh, advances, uh, understanding how the body reacts in, a, in a, a zero G or a microgravity kind of environment. So I don't know if it was wasted, but we, we, you know, we were learning and then building international coalitions around that uh, as we go forward. Now, clearly, you know, when we went to deep space, instead of putting someone back on the moon, we actually went to lower cost methods doing it robo robotically. Now, we deep space probes, right? We put uh, probes around Mars. We put uh, rovers down on the surface. Perseverance, uh, which is going up, it's to be the first, uh, basically, uh, helicopter we're going to fly around. Wow. Uh, Mars. So we'll get instead of a you know slow moving rover, we'll get a helicopter. And uh, for those uh, inclined to study this, Mars is only about two percent of the atmosphere of the Earth. So we first did a calculation. You'd have to have rotor blades like from a helicopter about fifteen times the the length, which we couldn't do with a you know Mars lander. But uh, JPL figured out how to do counter rotating uh, propellers and stuff to get it out there. Then Lockheed Martin did the ejection system to launch the the, uh, the helicopter. Kind of think of it as a small helicopter UAV, if you for lack of anything else. So we'll have cameras, it'll have probes to go around. So we're going to get a whole different perspective on the surface of Mars. We perfected that, but there's nothing better for exploring than a human being. <laughs> they can see something that's a little unusual, react. As much as we've mapped the surface of Mars many times over, we've only probably brought back four or five percent of the data just because of the bandwidth and comms. So getting a person out there with their, their inquisitiveness, their ability to reason and really look at something different is going to be huge. And that's why we kind of want to do both. And NASA's vision to try to commercialize LEO. And then as we go out and explore, uh, I think that's all going to come together and then we'll have a permanent presence on the moon. Nothing better for exploring than a human being, Rick. As of 2020, less than 600 people have even reached orbit. So many of us of a certain age wanted to see what Krista McAuliffe could teach us from 200 miles above. And we've been treated to some of that from the likes of Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield, who recently gave a spellbinding lecture at the New York Stock Exchange before the coronavirus hit. 
but what will it take to make space travel scalable so we don't have to rely on the mesmerizing reflections of Hadfield and allow the establishment of a significant human presence in orbit and beyond? I went to your website, saw the Orion capsule sitting there. The order is for 12 of them, but you're going to need more than 12 of these to get more than 600 people up into orbit. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, exactly. They're not going to bring large scale, but to, to get to, to that point, we have to still learn more. And I think getting out there and using Orion and then the uh, human lander system and eventually in, in the Lunar Gateway to get more uh, astronauts back and forth to discover and uh, what it's going to take to set up that permanent presence. Uh, but when you come back to long term sustainability or go to scale, uh, we have to keep driving um, one launch cost down in our ability to, to access space up and down at uh, fairly economical terms and be safe and reliable. Two is once we're up, we have to discover how to keep uh, people safe. Uh, we're still struggling with technology around the radiation environments. How do you protect people from long-term uh, microgravity exposure, which has an effect on the body? We've learned uh, from our you know, uh, International Space Station experimentation and things. So we have to solve that, but then going to the lunar surface where you at least get some gravity, I think is gonna help that. Then how do we establish the presence? How do we find uh, water? How do you find uh, produce fuel uh, you know, on the surface and then and, and build, grow, grow food, not just take it up there? Just, you know, because if you try to go to Mars, if you're going to rely on pure shipment back and forth, uh, that's an expensive endeavor. So how can we set up those ecosystems um, on, a, on, a, on a lunar or planet surface to go? So we have to figure all this out. Rick, in his review uh, for The New Yorker of one of Netflix's highly touted new series starring Steve Carell, Troy Patterson wrote, the lighthearted dystopia of Space Force is too close to home to serve as an entertaining escape. The show cannot escape the gravity of its own premise. But in reality, Rick, this is no longer the US and USSR racing to see who can get a monkey into orbit first. Talk to us about the real stakes involved right now, 250 miles over our heads. First of all, if you look at the, the space, come back to just the economic side of space and close to Earth, which by the way, 98% of the money spent close to Earth. It's about just under a $400 billion uh, enterprise that some will, JP, uh, or Morgan Stanley will say, is growing to about a trillion dollars a year by 2040. But if you put that in perspective, that $400 uh, billion, um, that actually engenders a multi trillion dollar marketplace. Right. So just take example of GPS. The U.S. government might spend, you know, you might see a few billions of dollars in, in, in a budget line. That's engendering the one or two orders of magnitude bigger than that in the economy. Just from, you know, if you stay in a home during COVID and you ordered Uber Eats or uh, DoorDash, they probably use GPS to get to your house. Right. But if you extend that and then clearly we the, the U.S. government uses that and as more and more and adversaries uh, get up there and um, uh, participate, it can threaten certain military uh, capabilities. Hence is why the Space Force was formed. Um, you know, as Lockheed Martin, we'll support a government organization regardless of how they uh, uh, organize because our job is to help them with their missions. But Space Force is definitely needed because of 90 countries are now engaged in space in some capacity. And this is a truly a dual use technology. Uh, the same weather systems and, and kind of technology can be used to find clouds are not too dissimilar than the same system that tr try and finds missiles. You know, I mentioned global lightning mapper that tracks lightning. They can see meteors as a kid in the atmosphere down to the size of about a grapefruit. So all that, so any, any attack on even the military systems will actually risk all that economic vitality and that's not just for the U.S., that's at global scale. But look through human history, wherever humans have gone, there's been conflict. Look at maritime, the maritime law, you've got a Navy, keep disguised, you know, you've got other forces. It's just, it's, I think it's just an evolutionary step that we're going to have to figure out, make sure we keep the peace. But space has its challenges. Um, someone that's a bad actor and destroys an asset, even through a test, leaves a ton of debris up there that threatens that human exploration. That'll threaten if you want to take um, human tourism or anything out to space. That makes it riskier. So we need to treat space today very sustainably. 
we need to come up with international agreements on how you act. If you put something up, how do you behave and how do you bring it back down if you can? Uh, if you do put an asset up there, how do you make sure it's not going to cause other pollutions or, or try to minimize it as much as possible? I think these are going to take international uh, cooperations to go do. I, I want to get into that a little bit, Rick. NASA is taking steps to prepare for governing space. I want to talk about the Artemis Accords and how the United States is hoping to build an established international law. The first tenet of the Outer Space Treaty is, and I'm going to quote it, the exploration and use of outer space shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interests of all countries and shall be the province of all mankind. So where is this headed from here? Well, I think you're seeing that play out now. I mentioned 90 uh, uh, countries are involved in space. NASA itself helps engender those countries. Uh, uh, they support a lot of tech transfer and enablement of a lot of these uh, particular missions and capabilities. Um, U.S. firms that support, uh, you mentioned uh, the UAE and the, and, the, and the Mars Project. Many, many countries and uh, companies uh, worldwide support them in that endeavor. And, and many of the other countries share a lot of the technology back and forth. Uh, it's a global supply chain. And you know, it's, what's interesting, is, as large as space is, it's kind of a small industry segment. And even with 90 countries, mo most of the supply chains and the different companies that interact know each other well. Of course, we have to follow, uh, you know, national policies and things and how that interaction happens. But, you know, there's a regulatory bodies that uh, govern that. But if we're going to go out and be sustainable in space, whether it's the moon or Mars, uh, my belief is this is, has to be international uh, it has to be a global cooperation. And think about maritime, and uh, I mean, a good equivalency of that might be where we end up as maritime law, right? If there's a vehicle, you know, if there's a vessel in distress, you know, maritime law says you render aid. Imagine if you're now one or two different countries are out on the moon or further in Mars, don't you want some policies that you render aid? Because it's, it's too far away. You know, there, no one's going to be able to send a really fast uh, rescue ship and come around, at least in the early days talk about cooperation between countries. I want to dive in a little bit to cooperation between companies, Rick. You look at that old footage of Saturn V launches and you see technicians in their white PPE with the names of so many different contractors working together to clear the spacecraft for liftoff. So many decades later, it seems like a similar cooperative spirit is taking place among the companies creating the technology needed to explore and colonize space. What's the relationship between the, the great established names in space and defense and the newer players coming from the tech world, such as, for instance, Blue Origin, where my old buddy Clay Mowry is head of the customer experience. Yeah, that's an uh, excellent observation. Um, I tell you, the reason I say uh, space is big, uh, the industry is small, is, is we do help each other. Uh, don't get me wrong, uh, everyone's competitive as well. But uh, w when, when you for form a lot of these uh, uh, you know, approaches in these programs as you go forward, it takes a lot of cooperation. Now, you won't see the same number of uh, company names and stuff as you saw back in the Apollo days. Uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, convergence in the industry and Lockheed Martin itself is, you know, a compilation probably about 67 different companies over the years. Where my take is, what I feel we have a, a special duty as Lockheed Martin for is we need a robust you know, dynamic market environment for it to continue. And that means you need a, a tier of competitors at multiple levels, supply chain, countries all involved, all competing, but all dynamic helping each other. Um, so for instance, uh, because we do Orion for NASA, a lot of data uh, as NASA funded that, uh, think of the parachutes as we re-enter, that data is shared with other companies that are re-entering to help them develop. Because, you know, that's what governments do, right? When you got the high risk point, that threshold, they're investing to, to dilute that risk. Then commercial companies or other players can come in and take that to scale. And that's a simple example of many, many of the other technologies, even some of the reentry uh, dynamics and the thermal protection systems and all that is all out there. And it goes, you know, NASA does that research you know, on behalf, but that is shared. Uh, in particular, for Lockheed Martin, we uh, we've spent about 100 million since about 2007 is we'll go out and find startup companies. And it's where they have a unique technology that we'd like to exploit and uh, move forward. And uh, as we do that, we help accelerate that tech into our 
into our um, into many of our customers uh, as we can as we go forward. And then as we um, uh, develop that, we'll either put it in or, or but we also help them. Uh, one example of that is a small sack company called Tyvac. We are both an investor in. We also partner with them to take capability uh, out for our customers. And so we recently flew a, a program we called Pony Express, which helped us validate uh, artificial intelligence. It's a new te- uh, additively produced uh, antenna uh, technology. That was on a Tyvac bus, but with our payload suite. And so we could go very fast to market, validate that, and that'll scale up to larger um, satellites. You know, I just want to reiterate, for this to be sustainable, to hit that trillion-dollar opportunity out there, it has to be a dynamic marketplace, you know, create its own capabilities, self-fund commercial markets, uh, and, and, and broaden that, that economy out. Uh, and it's got to be a multi, multiple players, multiple levels in there. Uh, and that's how we participate. You might be surprised to find out as well as uh, because it is a risky business, you know, you may have a competitor on a launch pad. If you've discovered a part problem that you know they use, there will be a phone call go across. Uh, I've received them from my competitors and I've (laughs) called other competitors to go and say, hey, we just discovered this parts issue. What do you do? Be careful with that. And the government entities are set up to process that kind of uh, capability. Talking about broadening the economy out, we have 50 states in this union, and Orion is NASA's spacecraft that's going to take humans into deep space from Florida. No other spacecraft in development has the technology needed for the extremes of deep space, such as life support, navigation, communications, radiation shielding, and the world's largest heat shield that's going to protect the astronauts when they do return safely home. Lockheed is the prime contractor on Orion, but how's the company working in every state in the country to create this sustainable moon colony? We actually hold, um, believe it or not, suppliers conferences every year in Orion in D.C. and bring everybody in, uh, one, to help coordinate what's going on and happening, but two, so even uh, Congress can see some of the uh, activities and the effects that that has across the board. Again, I think because of the rigors of space, we're going to go find the best in class of any capability that's out there. And what's, what's great about the new technology, it may not be sitting in one of the major state, traditional space states, think Florida, California, Colorado, uh, Texas, um, and maybe in some small state or a small company sitting in um, Illinois or Montana. If somebody has to come up with a great idea on how to protect with that radiation uh, there's also a global supply chain that feeds us as well. But if, if there's an expertise, and that's why uh, NASA established the partnership right with the uh, European uh, Space Agency to do the service module with coupled with us and, and the Orion capsule to go out there. Besides the collaborative aspects, the economic aspects that you and I have just talked about, what's going to make the Orion program stand out from other space delivery systems that people have become used to watching either the Apollo program at a certain period, the space shuttle program in the 80s, 90s, and aughts. I mean, I went to your website. I looked at the capsule and the rocket. It looks like a bigger Apollo on top and a space shuttle on the bottom. How should we think about it as an average space nerd? It will kind of look like Apollo because it's a uh, ballistic reentry. And so just by its nature of that kind of reentry, and what I mean by that, you know, it's going to come back in and the, it's going to use the atmosphere to help slow it down and things. So it's going to kind of form that shape and it's larger. But the inside is anything but Apollo. It has all the modern technology and avionics and flight. You can, uh, where Apollo was ballistic, uh, Orion does have the ability actually to navigate a little bit on its reentry because uh, it has an offset center of gravity from the surface. Not a lot, doesn't have wings like a, a shuttle coming in. But I think all the safety protocols we've gone through and the, the software. So we have a full digital twin model, by the way, of Orion, down to finite element models and some material. We do AR, VR techniques uh, for processing that uh, and, and helping keep the, you know, the kind of the cost down. We actually do physical models in there. I have a, a building over here. If you go in, it looks like someone turned Orion inside out. Uh, that's so we can test it after we go through all the normal simulation tests. We can actually test it thoroughly to keep those astronauts safe. 
And every cable an astronaut will see when it flies is there the exact length in case there's any extra delays we want to know and we test that out. So that's why we say it's safe is we know it's the rigor we've worked with NASA to go through all this test programs and everything. We know it's safe because, you know, everyone talks about a race. They say, Rick, do you want to be the first one on Mars or not? Do you want to be the first one? You know, I said, you know, we've had to look the astronaut core in the eye and say our job is to get you out and safely and, and back home to your families and what, you know, very safe. And that's what our focus is on that mission. You know, if you look back at Apollo, it went out and back in, you know, in, in days, not weeks to months. So you didn't have all those protective features. Uh, but because of the long duration flights, we had to put that protective features in. And frankly, we're still learning. We fly um, again um, next year. Uh, we're going to go out beyond the moon. We'll have tons of uh, devices on there to test and to look because that'll be the last flight before we put um, an astronaut in that capsule. And we're constantly collecting that data to learn, right? And then, by the way, the, the actual capsule will take astronauts out is under construction down uh, at the Cape today being uh, integrated. Talking about safety right above us, Rick, my old stamp collection is filled with commemoratives noting past missions that surely left a lot of debris floating above us. We talked about debris a little bit earlier. Currently, there are over 2,000 active satellites and thousands of defunct ones orbiting the Earth. Space may be endless, but there's only the, a limited space just outside our atmosphere. What needs to happen, not just for Orion, but generally to make sure that we can safely orbit the planet without getting into a literal train wreck? That is something we're concerned with as we go forward. I think we talked a little bit earlier about setting up international agreements and policies, um, even to the point where a lot of universities will put up a small uh, CubeSat, NanoSat. Uh, some of these don't even have propulsion systems, so they'll hang up there forever. And I think we have to come with a policy to how do you deorbit these when you're done with your test. And, uh, you know, it's not big money. It's uh, NASA puts on our website how to do a simple propulsion system on something like that, uh, and as does uh, ESA. And I think setting policies up, and uh, while it might be a little more involved in the design, if you want to learn space, and you have to learn the entirety of space, not just, you know, putting a small piece of a satellite up uh, that ends up becoming debris as an example. But then, uh, especially in low Earth orbit, the U.S. has pretty good policies. We build for our U.S. government. We have to deorbit satellites uh, that are there. But I think getting to an international agreement around that. And we have the Space Sustainability Index. We're working with the World Economic Forum, which is, uh, you know, they're not a over-governing uh, body per se, but there's uh, inter many international folks there uh, engaged. Uh, I know we're, do we're doing a lot of work there here uh, ourselves. There's European companies in there have agreed. They actually gave a contract through MIT's coming up with the Space Sustainability Index. So it'll have provisions and policy recommendations like that. We've also volunteered our satellites to be scored by this. But it'll also evaluate the satellite itself and how much uh, pollutants it might leave, let's say, in a, in a space environment your listeners may not be aware of, it's not the large things. Uh, stuff's moving about 17,000 miles an hour. So even a paint or a small little debris can be very lethal. The best thing to do is you can't fix what's already up there, but how do you go forward, do everything you can to minimize uh, debris and impact. After the break, Rick Ambrose, Executive Vice President of Lockheed Martin Space, and I will discuss how the space economy will shape the future of the economy and create jobs. That's all right after this. Navigating dynamic markets requires a relentless pursuit of knowledge. Now, join market experts to learn with ICE Education Live. Attend live video training with practical lessons across global asset classes. On-demand modules provide base knowledge. Participants can then attend live training sessions, including group review and tests for certification. We also tailor training for your needs and in-house projects. ICE Education Live courses. Continue your education today. Welcome back. Before the break, Rick Ambrose, Executive Vice President of Lockheed Martin Space, and I were discussing the impact of returning to the moon and how private companies are both competing and collaborating to drive innovation. Rick, you oversee, uh, I think, about 20,000 people who make up Lockheed's space division. 
We discussed in the first half how private companies and governments are working together, but growth and innovation is going to require a skilled workforce. How's Lockheed Space partnering with universities to make sure there's a deep pool of talent for all those jobs? We're in a transformative period here you know, that we're uh, working through an exciting transformative period uh, where we're able to now uh, move out and and try to re- reshape all the space, um, either satellites or vehicles we deliver, and make many of these software definable. So software, digital, all these types of skill sets are really important, but also knowing how to operate uh, in, in a tough physical environment, whether you're out in space or moving at uh, very high velocity uh, through the atmosphere. So more and more, we're doing more simulation, uh, you know, verification, full, uh, you know, augmented reality. Uh, you can go in and see, you know, Orion in an augmented reality cell, uh, as an example, or even satellites before we build them in that kind of uh, capacity. So that's creating a lot of uh, demand uh, going forward. In the meantime, um, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, a generational transition as well, uh, probably retiring 10% of uh, folks eligible every year, not just Lockheed Martin, the whole industry uh, sectors at, at some rate. So we partner uh, for that high tech quite a bit and not just with the universities. Uh, you know, we go out and cut partnership with other companies. Uh, you mentioned Blue Origin, as you know, we're, um, we're on their team for the human uh, landing system. That's going to go in. We do the ascent vehicle, which is based on Orion derivative, uh, Orion components. But with the the national labs we partner with, um, and then as well as the universities themselves, uh, and then we also, um, you know, invest in our own technology. Right? We probably spend uh, well over two hundred million dollars a year a year in R and D ourselves both accelerating the product as well as our own tech. And some of that's partnership with these universities. But a couple of programs, uh, yeah, there's probably 50 different universities for the whole corporation, uh, you know, um, across the country and some international universities, we uh, do partnerships and things with both uh, whether we set up labs or even uh, help uh, affect their curriculum or even recruit out of, right? So, uh, for instance, locally here at the University of Colorado Boulder, we got our Space uh, Systems Research Center. We help fund and we help, uh, we partner with them and we even bring interns. As we sit, we have 700 interns uh, sitting in our campuses just for space alone today. Uh, 60% of those are on campus, 40% are virtual. But it's, and some of those are high school as well as college. So we're actually, like most, reach down to high school to keep those STEM students coming through going forward, but we're also having to pioneer some of our own programs. Uh, some of the universities are, uh, are not graduating for us as software engineers as fast as uh, we need them, uh, with over half of my engineering staff being software engineers. So um, we have a SWAP program, we call it, Software Associate Degree Program, but basically we start taking um, either first year uh, junior college or right out of high school and put them in a developed program of our own and then as they uh, mature, we put them to work pretty quick. And as they mature, we'll actually fund them to go through a university degree program. Um, we're also partnered with the Metropolitan State University here in uh, downtown Denver, which is a minority serving institution. And there we set up a manufacturing curriculum and sponsored that. Matter of fact, you drive by their campus, you'll see an Orion scale model hanging in their uh, lobby. And then what we got started on, uh, believe it or not, as we uh, struggled with um, – some of our technicians, that's where we saw the early retirements in. And uh, so we created Advanced Manufacturing Tech Technician Apprenticeship Program. As the U.S. Department of Labor uh, registered uh, apprenticeship to train um, skills that we need on electronics and, and building these uh, satellites and things. Uh, that's a great program. And that's we've taken folks that have, you know, have career changes. It's about a six to nine week program, uh, depending on how they come in. And we actually, you know, put them into work right on satellite equivalent um, components and units and structures in their training. And they go right out to, to the, to the production floor after that uh, certification. But with that, I mean, you'll see like anything we're doing, uh, anything you're seeing that's uh, driving the high tech sector, you know, high density uh, computer processing, multi-core processing. I mentioned Pony Express. We uh, emulated and setting up a cloud in space because that's our drive. Uh, when you get these satellites uh, in, in, in the future, they're going to look like, uh, you know, an IT system you've had here in, uh, on Earth. So we can uh, flip processing in and out and repurpose them through software 
So think of personalizing your, your phone. We can uh, personalize satellites as you move them around and, and put them in different missions. So it's an exciting time bringing all this, uh, you know, high tech uh, capability in, into the uh, forefront here with this model based design and simulation and, uh, and augmented reality. And some of these interns are doing things that probably 20 years ago an engineer didn't do for five or 10 years. It's unbelievable what they're doing as they come into the workplace. You got your start at the DeVry Institute of Technology, your master's degree from University of Denver, but even traditional industries, not some of the ones that you were just talking about, are preparing to evolve their skills for space. Talk about your own backyard. The Colorado School of Mines now offers a degree in lunar mining. Do you actually see a prospect where the 2020 mining school graduates will find a, a job in a lunar drilling rig sometime during their career? I hope so. Uh, I would like to see that <laughs> as we go forward. When we get to the moon in 24 to see a mining career there, uh, there's no reason if we stay on course that shouldn't happen in a, in a, in a decade or, or two. You know, I do have to say, as uh, you know, when I watched that uh, Neil Armstrong first step on the moon, I thought by the time I hit four decades in my career, we'd be hopping around <laughs> uh, space a little more frequently than we are. So I'm hoping this time um, it's going to be a lot different in a mining, a lunar mining degree will just be one of many types of degrees we're going to see with space exploration. Dr. Paul Sutter, an astrophysicist, recently published a book called How to Die in Space that captures the multitude of dangers facing anyone exploring or living in space. You think, Rick, that technology will be able to overcome the dangers or will leaving the Earth remain the domain of the infinitely brave as exhibited by the 15 astronauts and four cosmonaut fatalities during space flight in addition to those that have perished during training. Yeah, and that's a good point to, to look at. Uh, you know, it, it, there's clearly hazards with space. I'm one to believe uh, as, uh, as we apply our innovate, innovative prowess as a country, um, as a world, and uh, put the, the best and brightest minds on this stuff. And some of those minds might be sitting in the colleges or sitting in high schools as we speak today. We're going to overcome those. But go back to uh, air travel. Back in the 50s, you looked at the number of uh, airline crashes and there are more fatalities. Now, you don't even think about getting on a plane. You, you know, it's a very, very rare, right? It's safer than driving home. And so when, when you go through that, um, I think the same thing can happen with space. In the beginning, yeah, it's going to take the, the brave uh, women and men that step on there and go out. But then we're going to learn, and which is why we're being uh, taking a lot of time with Orion and getting the safety thing. And there's some things we don't know yet. I mean, we don't know fully how to you know, perfectly protect from radiation. Uh, you know, there's a there's a there's a spot within you know Orion and you know the service model, which is uh, if there's a solar flare, well, they'll get alert from NASA to go you know hunker down and and uh, protect themselves. How do we get to the point someday where they don't have to do that? We have that tech today. We don't know, but we will create that. Uh, how do we go figure out how to mine and, you know, again, grow on another planet, grow uh, food? It, it's going to be different. You know, we, we don't, uh, there's a lot of great science going on. We're a lot of great break, breakthroughs by NASA and scientists and ESA, but we're going to have to solve that. And at first, yeah, we'll be more dangerous, but over time, we'll get it safer and safer. I think it's like anything else. The most optimistic writing, Rick, often portrays the experience of becoming a spacefaring people as the catalyst, perhaps, to put an end to war, combat famine and strife on Earth. But, you know, there's also an equal chorus of critics of that view. And in many ways, at its height, the space race was a unifying event in the country. You think it can be so again? Will the cooperation needed to explore space unify the world or will it just be a utopian fantasy? Well, I'm more of a optimist uh, going forward. If you look at the height of the Cold War, we had the Apollo Soyuz mission. You know, for many years, you know, with the United Launch Alliance, we flew Atlas rockets with uh, Russian engines. I think with the tech needed, my hope it does unify an ability, and I think we'll go faster. We can find a way to unify out and go do space exploration. And even with Mars 2020, there, there are international partners on that mission for NASA. So I do believe it's unifying, uh, not just utopian to go out. I also tell you, you know, when you go out, a lot of people want to go live on Mars. Um, uh, that's a pretty uh, inhospitable place. Um, 
right now, the earth is still the best uh, game in town. <laughs> and, and as we learn as we go out, we learn more how to protect this planet and how to manage this planet. And I think all of us on a global scale have interest in doing that. So, you know, I don't think it's going to be overnight. We're going to suddenly solve some of these issues, but as we, we move out and realize how, how precious the earth is, how uh, sensitive the environment we already talked about around earth and space is, because if we're going to navigate through that, we don't want a lot of debris and hostile things going on as we go out. And the more we can figure out how to go out and discover, you know, oceans and other planets and uh, water and, uh, you know, how to navigate around the cosmos uh, over the decades, I think that will be unifying in, in many ways. You mentioned Pony Express. As we wrap up, Rick, Lockheed Martin Space is working on thousands of projects. Which one do you think will have the most immediate impact on our day-to-day -day lives? You know, the interesting thing about that question, uh, if you talk to the probably an average person, they uh, they don't know how much they use space every day. And we've almost made it too good and too easy. Um, it's almost become ubiquitous, right? Whether uh, you're going to your ATM or transacting that credit card that's uh, being uh, tax, you know, helping uh, through GPS and space, uh, whether you're navigating and communications. Um, so my hope... Um, probably would be um, communications is probably the most dominant one people see every day and GPS with its navigation, you know, position timing, you kind of referenced uh, in your opening remarks. Um, all of these help save lives, uh, weather systems. Um, if you think of what space has done is it produces massive amounts of data at scale that can help improve the quality of life here on earth. But I'd say, you know, GPS navigation, communications are two, but I'm really fond of Orion <laughs> uh, and anything we're doing to explore. And I'll probably leave you one last uh, thought here on um, later in the year. Uh, you're going to see a, a probe we're working with NASA called OSIRIS-REx. And it's, uh, it's been hovering around the asteroid Bennu. This is one of those asteroids that come pretty close to Earth uh, periodically and the type of asteroid uh, and we've been down to 0.2 miles of the surface what's going to happen later in the year is we're going to go down we're going to tag it because we've caught it we're going to tag it but we're going to collect the sample on the surface they call regolith and we're going to bring that back to earth for the nasa scientists to uh, to study and understand better and that's going to happen but there's nothing more exciting than chasing down an asteroid it's been four years by the way of travel <laughs> chasing down this asteroid uh, collecting the sample, and uh, clearly everyone was surprised by what happened when we got there. Bigger rocks than we thought, everything else. Uh, so we're learning a lot about the cosmos. So not particularly fond of anything that we go to discover, how this uh, universe works and how this great world uh, ticks. So uh, I'll probably leave it with that. Well, from uh, my backyard with that telescope looking up at the ISS to uh, Cyrus Rex and what comes back when we finally get those samples back to Earth for analysis. Can't wait to discover more. Rick Ambrose, thanks so much for joining us inside the Ice House. Thanks for having me, Justin. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Rick Ambrose, Executive Vice President of Lockheed Martin Space. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. If you've got a comment or question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Pete Ash, Kearney Ferguson, Ian Wolf, and Ken Abel. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the remote library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Keep your eyes on the stars. Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 